Last week, we began a series on the subject of sin. And last week, we talked and began by looking at Satan's allurement in sin. We're going to continue that frame this morning, and we want to continue looking at Satan's allurement. And we want to see how he's going to entice us, how he's going to deceive us, in order to cause us to commit sin that puts us at odds with the God in whom we serve. In 2 Corinthians 11, we read this last week, it says, But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your mind may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Make no mistake about it, Satan is trying to deceive us. He is trying to deceive us by his craftiness, just like he did Eve, just like he did Adam. And he's going to do that by any means and opportunity that we give him. But understand also that he is trying to corrupt the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, it wasn't difficult to understand what God wanted Adam and Eve to do. He told them in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, you can eat of all the trees in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat that one. Because if you eat that one, you will die in the day that you eat it. And he told them that. And so it wasn't difficult what God told them. It was very simple. All they had to do is listen and when Eve was tempted by the serpent, she gave the verbatim answer of what God had told her. So she understood what God said. Satan just got her to believe that maybe that's not what God meant. And maybe God didn't tell you everything you needed to know. And so she fell prey to his trap. She stepped in the snare. She yielded to the temptation. And when she did, what God said would happen, did happen. And it will happen every time men commit sin. When they fall into the trap, when they yield to the temptation, they will commit sin. That's what Adam and Eve did. That's what will happen if we don't understand the enemy and understand what he's seeking and trying to do is to destroy our relationship with God. Again, the question begs to be asked, has God indeed? You see, he questioned God's word. You see, he wanted Eve to question if God really meant that. Maybe that's not what God meant. Well, yeah, you think that's what he said, but maybe he really didn't mean that. Yeah, he told you not to eat it, not even to touch it, or if you do, you'll die. But, you know, maybe that's really not what he meant. Maybe you misunderstood what he said. You see, so what was he trying to do? He was trying to get Eve to question God's word. And that's what he always gets men to do. He wants men to question God's instruction. He wants them to doubt what God said. And he does that by planting a seed. Well, maybe that's not what he meant. Maybe you misunderstood what he said. And maybe it really doesn't matter if you do it this way or that way. Again, he's trying to get you to question God's instruction, whether God really means what he says. Again, that's the line. That's the hook. That's the temptation. And we either reject it or we yield to it. And when we do, we commit sin. And so this is the way Satan worked with Adam and Eve. And this is the same way he works today. He wants us to question God's instruction. Whether or not it's really relevant. Whether or not it's really what he meant. And whether it's really that big a deal if we do it that way or not. That is a device and a mode of Satan to question God's instruction, to put it to the test whether or not that's really what he meant. Where Satan questioned God today, Satan works in this same way today. He still works in this mode. He still tries to get man to question God. Oh, it's not that God, God's instruction can't be understood. It's not that God has not been plain enough. It's not even that God hasn't been understandable enough. That's not the problem. The problem is Satan is in the business of causing man to question God. And if he can get him to question God, then there's a chance that he'll fall prey to temptation, he'll yield to it, and thereby he will commit sin. That is what Satan's hoping for. He's hoping that man will be convinced that he can question God. As God indeed said, evil company corrupts good habits. Did God say that? Yes, God did say that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33, do not be deceived. 
evil companions corrupt good ha habits. That's what God said. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with wise man will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Yes, that's what God said. God said you need to be careful about the people you associate with. You need to be very wary of the people that you are in an inner circle with and people that you allow to influence you, people that you allow to lead you or to guide you into things that are contrary to God. And God says that evil companions corrupt good habits. And he says don't be deceived. Brethren, when we put ourselves, and ladies and gentlemen, we put ourselves around people who are in the world and walk contrary to God's will and do things contrary to his instruction, then that can rub off on us. And that example can rub off on me. It can rub off on you. And therefore, we need to be very careful in who we associate with and who we give uh, respect to as far as following their example. And so, did God mean that? Yes, that's exactly what God meant. And many persons and many people have been led astray because they did not heed God's advice. Because they were around immoral people. They were around people that were ungodly. And it led them into doing ungodliness and immoral things themselves. Why? Because they didn't heed God's instruction. They didn't listen. They were deceived. They were misled. They were misguided. And they fell prey to the temptation and they fell into the trap. You see, but that's what God said, and that's what God meant. Has God indeed say, withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly? Yes, that's exactly what God said. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to tradition you receive from us. There comes a point when a child of God will no longer adhere to the teachings of Christ, no longer follow his instruction, but goes back into the world, goes back into the paths of sin, goes back to be a servant of Satan, to be his child. And when he does that, he has to be disciplined. He has to be corrected. He has to be shown that his conduct is contrary to what God wants him to do. And unless he repents, that, that conduct will lead him to destruction. And one of the final approaches of getting that person to see that his conduct is unacceptable to God, is to withdraw our fellowship. And what that simply means is to acknowledge that they are no longer part with us because they're no longer following God. They're no longer walking in the straight and narrow path as we read in 7, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Yes, it's not the first thing you do. It's not something we like to do. It's not something we do the first step. It is something we do when all else has failed. But God said that we need to discipline members who have become unfaithful, who have become unchristlike, who have gone back into the world which they at one time rejected. Yes, that's what God said. But you know, man question that. Oh, you're, you're not demonstrating love. Oh, you're being too harsh. Or you're driving them off. No, folks, that's human wisdom. That's human thinking. That's human prejudice. No, that won't work. But God says it's the highest form of love. Read Hebrews chapter 12, 5 through 11. God chastises those people he loves. He disciplines us because he loves us. When I had children in my home, I had rules. I had, they had, reg I had guidelines that I told them that they had to follow while they were under my roof. And I gave them consequences if they disobeyed them. Now, what did any of that mean? is if they disregarded my instruction and they went to do contrary to what I told them to do and then I told them I would do something and then I didn't do it. Well, then they wouldn't have any fear of disobeying me. The same thing is with God. God said, this is what I want you to do. This is the course I want you to pursue. This is the thing that I want you to do in service to me. And if you don't, here's what I'm going to do. But then what if he doesn't do it? Well, if he doesn't do it, then you don't have any fear of disobeying him. You see, that's what God said. Now, I know Satan and others, even some of God's own children, want to water this down. That, oh, God doesn't want you to do that because it's too unloving, it's too kind, it's too unkind, it's too harsh. No. God said when all else fails, you have to do that in order to save your soul. Read 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 11. That's what he told the church of Corinth to do when they were ignoring a brother in sin. 
They were told to deliver his flesh to, to Satan, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. You see, that's God's way. That's what God said. Now, either you believe it or you don't. But don't question God. He, he, he spoke to be understood. He can be understood. It's up to you and I to determine whether or not we're going to believe him and we're going to do it his way or we're going to put our own opinion in that. But no, that's what God said. And if we're going to be faithful to God, that's what we're going to do. As God indeed said, a woman is not to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Yes, God did say that. And I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Now, in the context here, we're talking about in the Lord's church. We're talking about in the church. That doesn't mean that she's inferior. It doesn't mean she's not intelligent. It doesn't mean that we think that we're better than her. We're talking about roles. We're talking about roles that God gave man and woman. And in the role of the church, men were given the spiritual leadership. They were given the responsibility of being the spiritual leader. And in the Lord's church, men are the spiritual leaders. That doesn't mean there's nothing that men, women can do. And it doesn't mean that they're not as smart as men. And it doesn't mean they're inferior to men. It just means they have a different role. But today, you've got women preachers, you have women elders, you have women song leaders, chorus directors, you have women in, uh, even in some churches, of being overseers and being elders. And in the religious world, you have them being bishops, you have them being uh, archbishops. You see, everything's changing. Why? Because that's what men want. That's what men demand. But you see, God said that that wasn't to be done. They were not to usurp authority. That means they were not permitted to be an authority over man. In their spiritual realm, they are limited to be in a submissive role. Read Ephesians chapter 5. You see, but the woman feminist movement has made it their lifelong uh, aim to show that that means that men think you're inferior and that men think that you, you have no value and that you're worthless. Nothing could be further from the truth. Any person that makes that argument has never read the Bible. The woman has a very vital role. She has a very important role. And it is necessary in order to make a home complete, and it's, it's necessary to make a marriage a good marriage. It doesn't mean that she's inferior. It doesn't mean she's a second class citizen. It just means that she has a different role. Yes, that's what God said. The saint said, well, that's not what he meant. And so we can change it. We can alter it to fit the, the thinking of the day. And without any repercussions, God says you can't. That's a violation of his law, and that means that that's sin. First John chapter 3 says, if we miss the mark, we commit sin. First John 3 verse 4. And when we go beyond this instruction, we commit sin. That's what God said. Now, either you believe it or you don't, whether you accept it or you don't. But the problem is God spoke in a very clear way to understand it's just whether or not we're going to believe it. As God indeed said, do not envy the oppressor. Yes, he said that. Do not envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways. For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is, is with the upright. You know, we're not to envy the oppressor. We're not to envy the person that's in sin. Oh, he may monetarily, he may do well. He may do, he may do lots of things that benefit him personally. And he may not have any physical problems, and he may not have any physical worries. He has money, he has possession. Everything's fine. But we should never envy that person. We should never envy the person who is walking in an ungodly way. Why? Because we don't understand what's truly valuable. And so, is that what God meant? Is that what God said? Yes, he said, don't envy the oppressor. Don't follow his ways. The men who oppress other men, don't follow that. Don't do that. Don't retaliate. Don't try to get even. That's the wrong course to pursue. You overcome evil with good, Romans chapter 12, verse 21. That's how you overcome evil with good. You don't overcome evil by doing more evil. You don't, you don't overcome oppression by being, a, being an oppressor yourself. No, that, God says that doesn't work. God says that's counterproductive. Well, either you believe it or you don't whether you accept it or you don't. And if you allow Satan deception to get in there, then you're going to practice things that are contrary to God's will, and you're going to do things that are an abomination to him. It makes him physically sick when people do things that are contrary to his will. 
And so either God meant it or he didn't. As God indeed said, do not boast about tomorrow. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may hold. James chapter 4 teaches the same truth. Teaches the same truth that life's a vapor that appears for a little while, and then man vanishes away. We need to understand time is not something we control. God controls time. God controls time and can bring it to a close anytime he wants to. He can send his son anytime he wants to. Our life can come to an end at any time that it happens. And we're all going to die according to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. So we're all going to die. We're all going to face death. And so we need to understand that we need not to boast about tomorrow. You don't have tomorrow. Yesterday is gone and all you have is today and you have no promise of tomorrow. And so you need to focus on today. That's what God said. Do we understand that? Do we understand not to get ahead of ourselves and not to live in our past and not let our past define us? Well, we've made mistakes. We can overcome them. We can learn from them. We can do better. But we can't unwind them. We can't undo them. And we can't get ahead of ourselves because we don't have any guarantee of another day. And so what we need to focus in is on today. We need to focus our mind and attention on today. And he told us in his word that we should not boast. We should not boast about tomorrow because we have no guarantee of tomorrow. We need to understand who's running the clock. We need to understand whose hands we are in. We are in the hands of God. And we need to acknowledge that and we need to submit to that. And so, yes, that's what God said. Don't boast about tomorrow because you have no guarantee of it. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you're listening to this broadcast this morning, and you know your life's not right with God, and you know there's things that you need to change in your life, you know there's things that you need to correct, you know that you're guilty of sin, you know that you need to do some things and get your life right with God, and you're going to do that, but you're going to work some things out in your life. You're going to get some other things accomplished first, and then when you get those things accomplished, then you're going to give your life over to the Lord. Friend, that's a dangerous way to think. Why? Because you have no guarantee that you will live long enough to get it correct. You have no guarantee of another day. You have no guarantee that you'll be able to live long enough to get your personal life in order, and then you'll give your life to God. You don't know that. That's a chance. That's a risk you're taking, and it's foolishness. It's foolishness. If you're within the sound of my voice this morning, and you know your life right, right with God, you need to find out how to get it right. And you need to do that today, not tomorrow, not yesterday. You need to do it today. And you need to understand that you should not boast that you have plenty of time because you don't know. In Luke chapter 12, the man that built barns because he had so much produce, and he built bigger barns, and he stored up all of his grain, and he was just going to sit back and eat, drink, and be merry because he was taken care of for years. God called him a fool. God called it, the Lord called him a fool in Luke chapter 12, verse 20. He says, tonight you, your soul will be quiet. Tonight you're going to die. And then what about all the things that you have stored up? Who's are they going to be? They're not going to be yours. So we need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that God means that we need to be thankful for today and not to get ahead of ourselves. That we need to understand that time is not something that's on our side, but it's on God's side. As God indeed said, do not lust after her beauty in his heart. Yes, do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelid. For by means of a harlot a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will pry, prey upon his precious life. You know, you heard that old saying, well, it's okay to look but not to touch. No, it's not. In Matthew 5, verse 28, Jesus said, any man that looks upon a woman to lust after has already committed adultery with her. He's already committed the act in his heart when he's lusting after her. No, it's not okay to look. No, it's not okay to look. No, it's not okay to think. As long as you touch, as long as you don't go react, as long as you don't follow through with it, then it doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter. Yes, it does matter. And if you look with lust in your heart, if you lust after it, then you committed sin. Now, nobody may know it except you and God. You know, I won't know it. If you're, lusting, if you're lusting after a woman that you see walk by you on the street, if you're lusting on a woman that you might even see in, in services of the church, or you're lusting after a neighbor's wife, or your friend's wife, you've committed sin. You're guilty of sin. 
That's what God said. God said that's a dangerous course to pursue because the only thing that keeps you from not acting on it is the opportunity. But you've already taken the opportunity in your mind and God holds you accountable for what you think. That's what God said. That's the danger of pornography, ladies and gentlemen. The danger of pornography is that it, it puts bad pictures and it puts bad concepts in man's mind about the expression of love in a marriage and the only place God gave men to exercise that desire that he put in every man and woman is in the role of marriage. But pornography, it clouds that. It makes it ugly. It makes it, it, it makes it something and it's not. And then it causes man to be warped in his understanding of sexuality and of physical intimacy. That's the danger of it. It gets in your mind. It gets in your head. And so that's what God warns us about, lust and the danger of it and what it can cause to do to us. But maybe God didn't mean that. Maybe he just meant don't do it. It's okay to think it. It's okay to look as long as you don't touch. No, God didn't say that. God said just the opposite of that. He said it's the same when you look to lust, you're dismissing the opportunity to do it. Now, did God mean what he said? Yes, God meant what he said. That's the way sin works. It begins in the mind. That's where sin gets its hold. That's where it gets its foothold in your mind. And then it acts out in action. In Matthew 5, 28. I've just quoted that to you, that if you look at a woman to lust after, you've already committed adultery. It's as if you've already done it with God because you've thought it in your mind. As God indeed said, do not associate with one who flags you with his lips. Yes, that's what God said. He who goes about as a tailbell reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with one who flatters his, with your lips. Proverbs 26, 24 through 28 teaches the same truth, as does Proverbs 18, 21. We need to understand that men might flatter you, may build you up, may make you feel good about yourself. But there's, do they have an agenda? Is there something they're trying to gain from you? Is there something they're trying to get from you? Again, you know, I heard the old saying one time, be wary when everybody speaks well of you. When everybody speaks well of you, something's wrong. That's a principle that's discussed in the Bible. When everybody thinks you're a great person, you're doing great things, and you begin, as we say, to believe you're press slipping, then you, you're in a position where you can be tempted and where it will lead you into sin. And so God, God did say, don't associate with people that build you up. Don't associate with people that are going to tell you what you want to hear. You want to associate with your people that will be honest. That when you make a mistake, they're going to tell you. When you're making a bad decision, they're going to tell you. When you're making a bad choice, they're going to tell you. They're not going to let you go down a road that will lead you to destruction. They're not going to let you make a decision that's going to harm you. Why? Because they love you. But somebody that's built you up, as we might say, be a yes person, that tells you everything you want to hear, that's a dangerous person to be around because he's not going to be truthful to you. He's not going to help you. He's going to hurt you in the, in the long run. So oh, it, 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 it feeds our ego. It feeds our pride. But in the end, it will destroy us. And so we have to be smarter than that. And the only way we can, the only way we can, is that we listen to God's instruction that we listen and do His will. Does God indeed say that wine is a mocker? Yes, that's what He said. Wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 29 through 35 talks about how it looks harmless while it's in the cup, it's swirling around, the red color, it looks harmless. And yet when it bites, it's like a, it's like a, a viper when it bites. And then when it he talks about a man being hit with a mask when he's under the influence of alcohol and he doesn't even know. And then what he, will he do? He'll try to get, when he wakes up, he'll go after another drink. The Bible is full of examples and passages of principles that man needs not to be deceived by the dangers of alcohol. And yet, man, even those who claim to be religious, claim that they can social drink, claim that they can drink under some circumstance, they can drink in moderation, they can drink socially, and that, all that will be okay. Yet, read 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, 
And in those verses, it condemns every level of drinking, socially, partying, and drunkenness. It's all three levels are condemned in the New Testament in 1 Peter 4, verses 1 through 3. And so, ladies and gentlemen, either you believe God or you don't. Whether you, you accept God or you don't, God says that sin. God says that will cause you relation with, with me to be marred. That will lead you into further problems, and it will destroy the good in your life. That's what God warns you about. He tells you that over and over by principles in many different passages. Well, do we believe them or not? Or are we going to let our own opinion, our own pride, and we decide as long as we do it in moderation, as long as we don't go overboard, as long as we don't, uh, as the saying is, that we don't get sloppy drunk, that it's going to be okay? No, God says it's not okay. God says that's sin. That's a transgression of his law. And that's conduct that's unbecoming of one that's called his child. He says to stay away from that. There's a danger in that. It controls your mind. It causes you to act and to think and to talk and to do things that you normally wouldn't do. Why? Because you're under the influence of something that's controlling you. You see, does God mean what he says? See, Satan, Satan is trying to get you to question God. Well, you know, God, he didn't, I know he said that, but that's really not what he meant. You know, and you, you, God gives you some wiggle room. No, God doesn't give you any wiggle room. Again, that's Satan's bait. That's Satan's snare. That's what he's trying to get you to do. Just like in the beginning. In closing, I want you to remember the first time that Satan did this. He did this with Adam and Eve. Did God say that you can't eat of every tree in the garden? Oh, yeah, he told him. That's exactly what he said. He said, we can eat of all the trees except the one in the midst. And he said, don't eat of that one, because if you eat of it, you'll die. That's what God said. But then Satan just added one little word. No, you won't die. God knows that in the day of it, you eat of it, you'll be like God. You'll know, be able to discern between good and evil. You see, he caused Eve to question God. Caused Adam to question God. Maybe that's not what he meant. Maybe I got some wiggle room here. He tried that. He deceived her. He misled her. He, he beguiled her. Why? Because he wanted her to disobey God. And she did. She yielded to him. And so the question comes to you and to me. Are you going to put yourself in a position that you're going to allow Satan to cause you to question God? Or are you going to trust God? Are you going to believe God? And are you going to obey what he says? Or are you going to follow the trap? the snare, the temptation that will lead you into sin. Satan counting on you following his lead and not following God. Ladies and gentlemen, you make that choice. But just remember, whatever choice you make, come with the consequence.